Hi, everyone. Final full lecture today in ecology, which is just great. It means you're advancing well through the semester. <coughs> it means I can start to really focus on research. It's exciting. Um, but I've enjoyed this lecture series a lot. We'll finish it up on, um, on Monday morning. Um, on Monday, I will conclude and um, give a very quick overview of, um, of the whole series, focusing on points of potential problems, points where I know there's been some confusion over the semester. Um, and then we'll go into a question and answer. Best if you can send me questions in, in, in advance so that I can um, have some material prepared. But if you want to um, just fire questions at that time, assuming there is enough time, you're most welcome. Um, but if you, can, if you can ask questions on email, that's great. And then I'll, uh, you know, if, if a few of you are focusing on a similar topic, then I'll know that that's a topic of confusion. Um, although I do know of a few of those already. Um, that's enough for now. Let's just get into today's lecture. Um, office hours are as usual after lectures and by appointment if you need to set one up. So let's get into our discussion of ecology today. This is really a focus on um, the role of ecology in environmental problems. Um, that's what I've chosen to focus on here. Ecology is an extremely dynamic science. Uh, much of the present and near future of ecology will be um, in terms of its integration with other disciplines, its integration with geology and with anthropology and sociology. As it always has been, ecology is an integrative field. And many of the solutions to our current problems, both in science and in, um, in the world at large, concern the need, you know, require that type of integration across disciplines. Here I'm focused on environmental problems primarily. You know how you watch a nature video on TV and it's an hour long video and you see all this cool footage of the rainforests or, you know, uh, whales feeding in the seas and then at the end it's the humans butchering the whales or cutting down the rainforest. You always get that at the very end of the program. Um, that's kind of what's happening here. I'm giving you the um, the problems here on Earth with the systems we've been looking at here at the finish. So you've seen the topics here, and I'll just um, get into them. Yeah, we could, um, we could spend a lot of time on environmental problems, and um, we could choose any number of them to focus on. I'm just going to choose a few of my favorite environmental calamities to talk about today. Um, we just would need a whole year to talk about uh, all of them in any detail. So what I'm going to try to focus on are a few of the most important problems um, that we face, but by no means will we have uh, full coverage, broad coverage. And I really hope you will continue to explore these issues and their solutions in other courses here and uh, in the future. There's uh, obviously very important roles that we as individuals and as communities can play towards a solution of environmental problems. Ecologists have a particularly unique role to play in the solutions to these problems. to create a bridge to last time. Remember, we were talking about measurements of carbon dioxide <coughs> from gas bubbles trapped in Antarctic ice. And a record of carbon dioxide in these gas bubbles as representing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over these hundreds of thousands of years, showing that carbon dioxide has cycled in parts per million relative to other gases in these bubbles, reflecting a cyclical change in temperature on a global scale. It's assumed from these bubbles 
as they represent the atmosphere trapped in that region, can provide some window on global atmospheric conditions and a reflection on temperature. Let's look into that a little more and let's extend it to today. We have spectacular data from Mauna Loa in Hawaii, a high elevation observatory where since the early 60s um, carbon dioxide has been monitored in the atmosphere at these relatively high elevations. And these data are some of those that have um, proven so valuable in the discussions of global warming and global climate change. These data have been, have been known for, you know, since this time and have been uh, scientifically well discussed since at least this, the 70s. The effect of carbon dioxide as a, as a trapping, um, as a gas that can trap radiation and warm an environment, that's been known for over 100 years. And speculation on the role of carbon dioxide and other gases as they enter the upper atmosphere as mechanisms to trap radiation as it bounces back from the Earth into space and to hold it into our atmosphere um, here close to Earth, that, that phenomenon's been known for 100 years and been discussed actively. This is not s some newfangled um, science. I was presented, um, I first heard about this information in the early 90s and in a talk um, that was very compelling and, um, you know, started to talk about it with, uh, with people I knew and <coughs> here, you know, it, it seemed very compelling. The, the data seemed real, the scientists seemed uh, honest um, and here we are today um, with quite rabid debates about um, the significance of these data. So let me, let me talk to you a little bit more about what, what we know. Um, we know that carbon dioxide as measured in this, in this observatory. This, this, these are actual data of carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere measured at Mauna Loa have been increasing in the cyclical way across these decades to the present. And you can think about that in relation to um, our previous data. In parts per million, we're at about 320 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 1960, close to 400 parts per million today. If we look back at that previous slide, we can see that that's, that's exceeding um, anything apparent over the last several hundred thousand years based on the ice core data. Looking at just the last five years, you're seeing the same trend of increase in, um, in carbon dioxide. This is the trend smoothed over the seasons. Why does carbon dioxide fluctuate like this across a year? These are, tw these are monthly intervals. Seasons, what about the seasons? What about the seasons in the world affects carbon dioxide in the atmosphere above Hawaii? Plants, what about plants? Yeah, with the seasons, in the winter, plants are absorbing less carbon dioxide as they become quiescent and don't photosynthesize as much. They're eating less carbon dioxide, but they're still respiring, and so they're still releasing some carbon dioxide. So you have a, you have a much less uptake. Um, you have much less uptake and a continued production by your primary producers leading to these cycles, and in summer, much more uptake by the primary producers. So you get these cycles across seasons with a steady, um, steadily increasing trend. That, this, there's nothing to argue with this. I mean, um, these are the facts, ma'am, right? Um, but a link between this and anything in terms of warming or climate change um, is also irrefutable. A link between carbon dioxide and the trapping of radiation and the warming of a of an environment, that's your greenhouse effect. Um, that's, that's physical, irrefutable evidence. Whether this is having an effect in the world, 
that's where people, um, that's where the debate occurs. Um, measurable increases in temperature, though, um, have been documented. And, you know, you, you see every couple of years, yes, we've just had the hottest year on record. It seems that we um, keep exceeding ourselves in terms of global average temperatures. Is this correlation a result of causation? Scientists don't uh, disagree very much on this, in spite of what you might hear in the, in the popular press. Most agree that there is a real causal effect here and that um, the production of CO2 in the atmosphere is largely a result of fossil fuel burning and production. Um, this is just the warming aspect of the phenomenon of global climate change. In a way, scientists are to blame for the confusion, the popular confusion surrounding this, in having just focused on warming, the warming trends related to greenhouse gases, and CO2 is just one of them. Methane is another major one, carbon monoxide and others. Um, we have called it global warming, but it entails much else with regard to changes in climate, changes in precipitation, areas becoming more dry or more wet over time, with fog here in California, how these changes might influence fog regimes. Um, temperature is just one aspect of it. And so when we call it global warming and we have a really cold winter with a lot of snow like last year, everyone can say, aha, it must not be happening because it's so snowy outside. There's three feet of snow. Global warming, poof, impossible, right? Um, that, so scientists uh, probably um, could have done better over the years in clarifying what was meant by quote unquote global warming or sticking to global climate change in the, in the whole discussion here. This is something you don't hear that much about anymore. You used to hear more about it. Um, this is the phenomenon from 1979 here to today, the formation of a very thin ozone layer, particularly over the uh, southern pole, the thinning of the ozone or the hole in the ozone hole. Um, this, you hear less and less about it perhaps because um, because changes, political changes in terms of the use of chemicals, particularly chlorofluorocarbons, um, have helped to mitigate this problem. And yet the problem remains very real. The hole over the Antarctic in the ozone layer um, reached its maximum extent just in 2006. And today, as represented by the bluer and purpler areas of this measured in Dobson units, which I'm not exactly sure how you compute, uh, how you measure these, this in Dobson units, but the, the bluer, purpler regions represent a thinner layer of ozone. Um, this is very much real today, and you can go on, online and look at today's hole, the hole as it exists today, and you can do that on a daily basis if you want. It looks much like this, um, and it changes seasonally as well. But changes um, in relation to our use of particularly those CFCs, remember those are the chlorofluorocarbons or the things that Al Gore could actually pronounce and got him into so much trouble for being able to pronounce it. He seemed like such a geek. Um, but he was calling attention to a, a this problem uh, early on. And fortunately, uh, there was pretty good political movement on this. And restrictions on the use of those CFCs have helped to um, mitigate this problem. But here we can see this ch in, a, in terms of the percent change in ozone over time, the fact that um, we have seen these decreases, particularly since the late 70s is where it really took off, um, through, to the, through to the early 90s, and this is where I started to hear about it, and you really used to hear a lot about it here. And then look, it, um, it's maybe stabilized a bit, um, but it remains a real problem. What is the problem here with uh, a thinning of the ozone layer? And just here to show you that at zero degrees latitude at the equator, percent ozone change is much, much less than it is at the poles. It's more dramatic at the poles. And thus, maybe we hear less about it here than they hear about it in Australia um, or in southern Africa or um, places like that, where it's a more significant influence, South America, tip of South America, where it's a more significant influence on 
people and organisms than it is for us here in California. Well, what's happening, this ozone layer in the stratosphere, O3, ozone, in the, in the stratosphere above 15 kilometers over Earth helps to protect the Earth from harmful UVB radiation, ultraviolet B radiation. Ultraviolet A radiation can penetrate the ozone layer <coughs> fairly easily, but ozone B, uh, UVB is reflected back into space. Very harmful types of radiation that can cause cellular malfunction, can cause mutation, um, genetic mutation, and can be harmful both to humans and other all organisms, and uh, can be responsible for skin cancers and um, interruptions of growth cycles in plants and, and all other creatures. Ozone in the, in the very lower atmosphere, um, we hear of sometimes because of its role in pollution and smog. Ozone down here is far less desirable than ozone up here. So you should be aware of that. You can look at the details of how this process works in the book, just a figure from your book, how um, CFCs and chlorine break up the O3 ozone molecule into a free oxygen molecule and a bound oxygen chlorine, it's, you know, chlorine monoxide or something like this, um, that then with radiation, with sunlight, will break again to free the chlorine molecule and cause this cycle to go, to proceed further. So your chlorine breaks up the oxygen, forms a new molecule that then breaks up, releasing that chlorine to be allowed to go break up another um, molecule of ozone. And uh, that degradation can continues uh, in the presence of sunlight. So by limiting the amount of chlorine heading into the upper atmosphere, we mitigate this problem. Closer to home, um, problems with refuse. Uh, you've all encountered this. Um, the reality of the problems of consumer waste and what to do with it here on Earth. Obvious problems stemming from a landfill environment like this are the leaching of chemicals into neighboring waterways, the uh, release of gases from such landfills that can play a role if you drop your refrigerator into one of these landfills. Um, the gases in your refrigerator can escape and get into the atmosphere and potentially cause, for example, problems in the ozone layer. But more locally, problems with runoff entering waterways affects organisms and communities, including human communities, as it pollutes drinking water. But did you know that in the oceans, for example, in the Pacific, these gyres of currents collect trash into these massive zones of debris where the trash coagulates and, you know, fishing nets and, but everything, you know, from slippers and trash cans and all manner of things collect into this, into these giant um, debris zones in the Pacific. And they've been identified in the Atlantic Ocean as well. Uh, you know, twice the size of Texas here, they say. Um, this fairly concentrated zone of debris. Now, it's not like it's completely dead. Organisms are living on these plastic bottles. Um, maybe you have some mollusks attached and crabs. Who knows, maybe evolution is occurring quite rapidly there, in these new ecosystems. Um, probably so. But this is also a major hazard to existing forms of marine life. Um, some of the dramatic examples come from birds such as albatrosses, who, where the parents are collecting this trash, feeding on it, uh, r considering it some, something to eat, and bringing it back to their chicks and feeding the chicks. And then you get a chick with a belly full of plastic and debris. And if the parents don't die right away, well, the chicks will starve because uh, they're hardly getting any nutrition from this. So organisms are eating this stuff. Turtles are getting caught up in this stuff. And this is something, you know, as individuals, um, we could be more careful about, about the way we do or do not recycle these materials. Um, as opposed to having them end up on the beaches and in the water, um, or perhaps choosing alternative types of materials with which to construct our bottles and, and cups.
um, rather than long-lasting plastics in the first place, things like this. But did you know that we have problems with refuse and debris in space? Um, these are representations of, these are, these are actual uh, objects of debris being monitored by NASA in space, um, <coughs> mostly from satellites and uh, you know, rockets that have, satellites that have been abandoned and, uh, and, or rockets that have exploded and cast debris about. These things are orbiting Earth. They're not, this is not to scale. The objects are not this large. Some of them are quite tiny, but something this tiny moving as fast as these objects are moving can be incredibly destructive to um, <coughs> functional satellites and so forth that are in, the, in orbit here. So we have problems um, at several levels with simple physical debris circulating in these areas, in these ecosystems. Not sure you can call these ecosystems um, unless you have living organisms present, um, just another representation of uh, actual debris loads uh, on Earth. Yeah, but that's not, um, you know, heading into space, we're leaving, um, we're leaving Earth and the, the problems we have um, with organisms here. And that's one of the frustrations that ecologists sometimes encounter in science. Incredible, incredible funding is put into space exploration and the development of space programs. Um, ecologists would not want to say we shouldn't do that, but they should say, hey, why not also put equivalent sums into our problems here. Um, and that, that can be a source of frustration when uh, billions and billions are spent um, off Earth, um, whereas so little is put in so very often to problems on Earth. What is going on there? Uh, why do we do that? Um, to some, it can seem like a sort of escapism from our real world problems. Here's a definition of conservation biology. It's a bit narrow, but, uh, but we can think of conservation biology as a type of applied ecology, primarily concerned with population declines and their causes. So an applied e ecology concerned with no changes in species numbers, and changes in numbers of individuals and species populations. <coughs> the study of that and attempt the study of the explanations for such declines. And this is happening in so many species. We're seeing declines in numbers. What is a hazard when population numbers decline in a species? Why is that a concern? Anyone? What's wrong with a small population? Extinction risk. Yeah, I mean, you'll get a lot more of this in the evolution section, but we, there's a concept of an effective population size below which a population is um, <coughs> vulnerable to chance events and to other phenomena that can lead to extinction. And so if populations dip in numbers below a certain size, um, they, uh, they face the reality of uh, extinction. So what? Um, there are a lot of species on Earth. We don't know how many, but there are millions. Well, not all species are created equal. Some are dramatically uh, more important to us as humans than others. That's true. Um, are all species worth fighting for? You get into moral and ethical arguments. I mean, the parasite, the uh, you know, the nasal, the nasal fungal parasite that infects human beings in the tropics. Is that worth fighting for? If it were at risk of extinction, would you want to battle for that? Um, maybe not to the degree you would want to battle for another type of creature. That's okay if we have a pecking order here on Earth in terms of our, uh, in terms of who we uh, invest most resources and activity in trying to trying to protect and save, but we need to be careful. We tend to go after the charismatic big organisms that we like to look at and that seem cool or cute, right? So the, these charismatic creatures that we really devote our energy and resources to, um, we might want to question 
some of that distribution of activity and energy. I won't name names, uh, uh, but you, know, you, can, you can guess maybe of some of these creatures. Um, and then what I'll want to suggest here is that maybe we also need to, and, and ecologists certainly are doing this and have been arguing for this, we need to pull our, pull our perspective a bit off of individual species and look at whole ecosystems and look at the preservation of habitats um, equally. But let's, let's just take a couple of examples and uh, from populations in stark decline at the moment that uh, if you don't know about them, maybe a good idea to know about. Hopefully these things will turn around and this will just become an anomaly of the last few years. But in the last five or six years, there has been a stunning collapse in honeybees. Um, and it's called colony collapse disorder. People have been keeping bees uh, for, for millennia. Humans have been, um, had this mutualism or commensalism or something with, with bees. If you think the bees are getting a lot out of this, then this would be a mutualism, uh, where we, we certainly are benefiting from the products of, uh, of honey. Um, the bees are benefiting, they get a place to live and they get tended to. Uh, but who, uh, who else is benefiting from this system? A huge number of plants by virtue of the pollination of those plants by these bees. And via the plants, huge numbers of other organisms and species in the communities where these things are living. This is a complex network of connections uh, where the bees play a critical role. And today, these honeybees are extremely important. You probably can't read it out there. I'll give it to you on the slide. Extremely important in the pollination of human crops. So this is just in the percent um, percent of these crops pollinated by honeybees. For example, almonds. Looks like, if you believe the data here from this uh, New York Times article, um, almonds are exclusively pollinated by honeybees. If you didn't have the honeybees, you'd have a real problem um, in propagating almonds or um, apples, um, primarily pollinated by honeybees, peaches, um, blueberries. Um, and so what we've been seeing are the collapse of colonies. Colonies collapse naturally. They'll just go through these die-off periods. But since 2006 or so, it's been a striking die-off where um, the beekeeper will go out and just either the worker bees are gone, they've just disappeared, or there's just uh, dead bees all around the hive. And uh, quite simply, it's not known what's happening here. Um, mites are probably part of this. Fungal pathogens are probably part of this. But this is set into the context of global climate changes and the alteration of local systems. Some people think that alteration of local systems has um, caused nutritional problems for bees. What you have, as in so many other cases, is a combination of stressors and nonlinear effects between stressors that can lead to uh, disease in a population. And these, these multifactorial stressors can be hard to tease apart and it can be hard to single out any one specific smoking gun problem. It can be hard to find that smoking gun as to which of these is the cause. We tend to seek the cause. What's the cause of this? Well, in ecology, it's often multifactorial. You often have a combination of causes that have antagonistic effects. You may have heard of a synergy where one effect combined with another effect produces a combined effect disproportionate, um, disproportionately large, larger than the sum of the two effects individually. That's what you get in ecology. You get these, these, these kinds of circumstances. And ecologists are actively studying this. Um, it's an agricultural crisis. Um, it's a boon to people who, who have colonies and drive around in their trucks and uh, park next to farms and the farmers pay them so that the bees can sit there for a while and help to pollinate the crops and then they drive on to the next county and park again. Um, it's a booming business right now if you want to get into that. Um, hopefully this will just turn around. I really hope in 10 years uh, this will be a historical blip. Um, yeah, question in the back. Uh, 
importing bees to try to replace the honeybees colonies that are collapsing. I haven't heard much about that. And let's talk about invasive species a bit, because um, that may be um, something that we should focus on, but the, the, the intrinsic risks to doing li something like that are absolutely fabulous. And um, ecologists are very careful about that for, for good reasons. I'll give you a couple of examples of why we need to be really careful about um, those kinds of introductions. Sometimes they present great solutions, though. Just quickly, um, bats in the last, again, uh, this was first noted in just 2006, uh, white nose syndrome. You, f you find these bats with, uh, it's a fungus that's attacking them, primarily around the muzzle there, also on the wings. Um, hibernating bats, it's a fungus that requires very cold temperatures to grow. So it's just bats that are hibernating in caves in this region. First noted in, in Pennsylvania or New York, somewhere here. But each year, um, more and more, it's similar to the bees, are these kind of collapse of the colonies where you find a bunch of dead bats around the, around the cave. The fungus seems to rouse them during their hibernation from their torpor. So they, they wake up and, as a result, starve because they wake up and there's nothing to eat. When they should be hibernating, they wake up, can't feed, starve, and, uh, and die. Um, Hopefully, this will just remain limited to um, bats in colder areas, um, but it's spreading and uh, they're closing caves. This, this, it's a fungus, so the spores of the fungus can be easily passed along on human clothing, you know, and caves are widely visited by humans, so people, you know, visitors to caves here, if they visit another cave in the Rocky Mountains, say, they could, they could transport this kind of fungus. Um, so many caves are being closed to visitation, another real crisis. What, bats are great pollinators too, but bats are great insect consumers. Bats are voracious mosquito consumers, for example. Um, they are tremendously important, just um, partly out of their sheer numbers and their, the rapidity of their activity in, in community structure. Can't afford to lose our bats. So ecologists are out there and trying to ass assess the problem. Uh, the fungus is obvious. Uh, you walk in and you see their little white noses. But is that the cause? Is there not a, um, a complexity of causes, a complex of causes that, um, that are giving rise to this problem? It's hard to tease apart. So if we have to just choose two of our favorite environmental problems um, to focus on as as most important. Um, they might be habitat alteration and invasive species. And so those two I'm just going to, um, to review here. Um, habitat alteration is, is what, it, uh, what it sounds like. It's just the changing of natural habitats for um, some human use. Often this is um, in order to clear land for agriculture or development of some, some kind. And obviously, when you take a forest and you knock it down, you're changing, radically changing the physical conditions and the physical environment for the living biota. You're not only removing species, but you're altering the physical environments for the existing and remaining species. You're creating edges to the systems that you leave intact. You might clear this land and say, okay, I'm going to leave this patch and this patch. And those, it's less than existed before. Organisms will have less space to live in, but at least they have these patches. Well, we'll look at, um, at the effects of creating such edges in a minute here. But just, uh, just examples maybe, uh, maybe close to home for some of you there. And here's a, so here's, here's a very, very common phenomenon of, an, of a region settled and development, developed for human activity over the years. Um, you end up carving up the original system into patches that then get winnowed to smaller and smaller patches. <coughs> less and less space for organisms to exist in, but notice that the effect on a percentage basis that this has in terms of the role of the edge in the functioning of those patches. 
These are artificially created edges. That's what I'm describing here. Anthropogenically created edges. Edges in natural systems are often very fertile boundary zones. We introduced the concept of an ecotone, right? I know a couple, some of you probably, maybe a lot of you didn't understand it, and I'll address it again on Monday. But an ecotone is a boundary system between communities that's often very rich because it has, it shares members from the two neighboring communities and then has members that are unique to itself, unique to that ecotone. And it's often very fertile and diverse. So that's an edge. That's an edge zone in a, natu in a natural circumstance. But an edge created artificially is somewhat different. Um, here's an example of uh, some human beings moving in um, and cutting uh, at a forest. Years later, the edge isn't holding up in this kind of structure where you have these species of tall trees living at those edges with your sub canopy and, uh, and a ground layer of vegetation. Instead, you, may, you might see this kind of pattern, an effect of the edge in this way. Think about what happens to the physical environment at the edge. If you cut, say, the forest that existed here, this region, which had been sh in the shadows with cooler temperatures, less exposure to wind, is now exposed to a lot of sun, a lot of wind, and warmer temperatures. These plants are not acclimated to that ki type of condition, and they, they won't be able to survive it. The, the community will change and it will be, it'll be pushed back in a sense. Um, these, those plants will be lost. Others might survive for some time, but you'll have reorganization of the community in this area. Those, those the community reorganization is gonna ripple through such a system. So patches with, with a lot of edge are going to be uh, nibbled at from the edges um, in terms of ecosystem dynamics. And this needs to be considered when uh, when thinking about areas to conserve and preserve. Buffer zones are uh, now a fairly standard part of preserved construction, creating a zone of maybe limited use um, around an area of more strict protection because that buffer zone can help, as it says in the phrase, to buffer the interior system against the insults from the exterior system. Um, sort of creating a, a more gradual edge effect, um, if you want. And here's an example with grizzlies from your book. Those patches of habitat, what if we're talking about squirrels in those patches of habitat? Um, it might be hard for the squirrels to get across those open <coughs> agricultural fields and across the roads in order to find uh, other squirrels with which to reproduce. And you can get these very small populations in those patches, vulnerable to lo local extinction or vulnerable to inbreeding problems, such that the um, cross-pollination, if you will, of squirrels between patches is critically important. And thus, um, the necessity of creating corridors um, across which organisms can pass when moving between patches. The habitats are, these habitats are inevitably going to be patchy and fragmented. And corridors can help a lot for some organisms to create connections between patches to allow organisms to cross and commingle. And you see this sometimes on highways. Um, bri bridges constructed, you know, particularly in areas where you have an endangered species or a charismatic species that's of interest. Um, bridges specifically constructed as uh, passageways for, say, um, elk or something like that. This probably could have gone earlier. I just wanted to focus on um, the major problem of um, alteration of the nitrogen cycle and the runoff of nitrates from agricultural communities. The whole uh, Mississippi drainage basin up into the interior of America. Think of all the farms along the rivers that eventually lead into the Mississippi and other rivers that eventually dump into the Gulf of Mexico. All the runoff from those systems, all the fertilizers that are used on those agricultural lands that make their way into the waterways, down the waterways, and ultimately into the Gulf. 
what's one thing caused by um, those inputs? It's a eutrophication, of course. Elements that are used as fertilizers are used as fertilizers because they're often limiting to organisms, to plants and crops. Well, they're often limiting to other organisms in waterways. And when they get into those waterways, they cause explosive blooms. And so in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, a very real phenomenon for very a very long time has been um, the formation of these dead zones of activity where runoff has created blooms that have deprived these systems of oxygen. The poor Gulf of Mexico, right? I mean, add insult to injury. Um, this is a this you know this has really been a dumping ground um, for Americans for a long time. It's been completely mistreated, and uh, it's, it's so heavily taxed to begin with. It's an incredibly rich region and fertile region for the production of uh, of food, and in spite of all this, and now you have this, and um, we need to do more to just uh, lessen the impact. Um, before we get complete system collapse. Um, and, you know, that's uh, n the stuff I'm presenting here is not technically difficult. I'm hoping, uh, if this is new news to some of you, that it'll get you to think about some of these things differently and uh, maybe get us to um, think about our own individual actions a little bit and, and what we can do um, at a community level for some of these problems. They're way too big for any individual here to solve, but uh, we can all do small things. Invasive species, another of my favorites. Um, this is uh, the brown tree snake that's moving around uh, the South Pacific, has been for a while. That's a great invasive. It stows away on ships, um, gets to islands, settles in. It's a, it's a little constrictor, I believe. It's a little predator. It's a predator of small vertebrates, primarily. And just starts to devour the local local birds. Um, lives lives primarily in trees. Um, just eat, just voracious. Just eats everything that it can that it can handle, and uh, wipes out um, the vulnerable life on many of these small tropical islands. Um, extremely stubborn and hard to manage, and you know moving along in the on ships um, easily moves from island hops. And so people take strenuous measures to search ships when they come to port to see if any of these things might be hiding out. But it's extremely hard to, to handle. An example of a great invasive species, one where that encounters island faunas. And these insular faunas are often particularly vulnerable to such invasions because they haven't evolved with similar predators. Um, Maybe one, if, uh, if any of you are from the southeast U.S., kudzu. Uh, it's a Japanese plant that made it into the southeastern U.S. You drive along the highways um, or in some local communities in the southeast, and you just see these banks and banks of this viney-looking plant covering the trees. You know, you have your trees, your, your forests, but all you see is kudzu because it's just festooned over all the trees, just blanketing them, an invasive uh, climbing plant that you can imagine the effect. It just covers, if you're a tree and you're covered by this, um, it's going to be capturing all the, uh, all the light and the photosynthetic, doing all the pho photosynthesizing, smothering the tree underneath. But a couple of, just a couple of my favorites. This is, an, this is a group of creatures I actually study in Africa um, <coughs> where they live natively. Giant African snails, giant African land snails. These are the biggest snails on Earth. There are a bunch of species in Africa, and they're fabulous in Africa, um, keep them there, thanks very much. Um, but the fact is they're great food for people. If you know how to cook them properly, um, in blind taste tests, they perform just as well as your finest escargot. Um, and, and they're huge, uh, bigger than your hand, and pack a lot of meat. And so during the world wars in particular, they were exported around the world as a possible good food item uh, for people. Anyway, they did all too well in tropical islands around the world. Um, great consumers of crops, voracious uh, plant eaters, and have been extremely hard to eradicate from tropical island environments, moving aqua across Brazil quite frantically at the moment. 
they were, they have been introduced and released in Florida and Arizona, places where they actually were eradicated through very strenuous efforts. As much as I would like to keep, they make great pets. They're very personable and uh, th they're just lovely and I really want a couple as pets, but um, I would have to get scientific permits to be able to keep them. You're not allowed to bring them into this country. <coughs> Brilliantly, um, as an attempt to control them, and this is one of these examples of a, a possible solution gone awry, these carnivorous snails are introduced into places to try to manage these invasive African snails. So you introduce an exotic species to try to manage a, a problem species. Well, these things, although they will eat Akatina, they will also eat your native mollusk, and they do that. You introduce your predator, and it wreaks havoc on the native mollusks and hardly limits the target population. Um, just a couple of these warning examples. The mongoose is a famous example of this. This small Indian mongoose, Herpestes oropunctatus, or Javanicus, was first introduced in Jamaica to control rats in cane plantations. Um, it ate some rats, but the rats tend to come out at night and the mongooses tend to come out at in the daylight hours, so they didn't even see each other all that much. Um, but the mongoose was very happy to eat the local snakes and birds and insects, and uh, this is another one that's on many tropical islands and extremely hard to eradicate. So we need to focus on uh, ecosystems, whole habitats, in, and not just particular species. These are the places where these organisms live, after all, both on land and in marine contexts. What do you know? <laughs> George Bush preserved a marine area in the, um, around Hawaii in the Pacific that's one of the biggest in the world on his way out. Nice work, W. <laughs> it's a great, great effort. I mean, um, anybody can do this, you know? Uh, yeah, sorry about that. <coughs> I'll try to leave it on a positive note here, restoration ecology. Here's uh, an example from a, an area in New Jersey before ecologists moved in and introduced organisms that are known to grow in such a, uh, a wet environment in such an area. This is a former mining area. After 10 years, you can reconstruct something like this. Yeah, it just makes you feel better, right? Um, <laughs> Or if you want, a great example is just down at the marina, Cesar Chavez Park in Berkeley. You can go see burrowing owls there. This is a former landfill. Great park right down University Avenue there. Have a good weekend, everybody.